Hope you're doing well today. My name is Dara Halladier. We're studying through Practical Proverbs for the Older Student, and we are Lesson 23 today. Are you content? Are you so happy with who you are, what you have, that your eyes aren't wandering going, oh, I would be happy if only I could dress like her or look like her or have that swimming pool or have a this car or that car if only I had that family or if only she was my girlfriend or are you just okay content at peace with what God has provided for you and where you're at with that there's a lot to be said in the word of God about contentment Paul was talking he says I've, I've experienced want I've experienced what everything I needed um, I've experienced poverty I've experienced riches I've experienced so many things and in whatever circumstances I am in, I am well content. We can be content in Christ, no matter what circumstances we're in. Um, I knew a young lady once, she was she thought, well, if I just get married, then I'll be happy and I'll be fulfilled and I'll be satisfied. So she got married. Then she thought, well, it, this is such a small little apartment. If I could just get a bigger place, then I'll be happy and content and married. Then it was, if I could just have a dog, if I had a dog, then I'd be happy and content. And um, then it was, I, I need a cat. If I, if I have a cat, then maybe that's going to fill me up. And she finally divorced and has, has lived a, a hard lifestyle since then. Because none of those things will satisfy. God created us each with a God hole within us. We can try and fill it up with all sorts of stuff. But it's only God who will fill it up to the point that we're satisfied. And we can be content no matter our lot in life. My husband and I had three little boys. Um, we had a big house up in Minot, North Dakota, Burlington, North Dakota, up by Minot, and um, probably 1,900, 2,000 square feet. He had a, a good job, and you know everything was wonderful. And then we decided to go to seminary. We sold everything, took three three boys down to Fort Worth, Texas, and moved into a 600 square foot apartment. Now that's small. It was two bedrooms. Had a little bitty bathroom and a, a kitchen um, living room area. That was it. It was very small, 600 square feet, a fourth of what we'd been living in. And, you know, those are some of the happiest times of my life. The memories that we have there playing under the table uh, in tents and um, just on and on. My son's crib was in the living room. And so when he rest, rested in the afternoon, we all rested because or they played in their rooms quietly. But there was so much peace there and so much contentment. It wasn't about our circumstance, our situation. It was about what God was providing and who he is and, and that we were in him. And that those are the circumstances he gave us in that moment. Um, and that, that we could accept that. Um, I've shared before, I live with constant chronic pain. Um, I'm content in that. It's what God has allowed in my life to produce in me the, the, the eternal weight of glory. Um, let me find that verse. It's over in 1 Corinthians. Um, this is, my, this is a, one of my go-to verses on and on uh, again and again. Let me see if I can find it real quick. It must be in 2 Corinthians. Here it is. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though the our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day for momentary light affliction, which is any storm of this world, anything this world can throw at us momentary light affliction compared to eternity it's going to be like that is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison while we look not at the things which are seen but the things which are not seen but the um for the things which are seen are temporal temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal you know um, learning to, to lean on God and have his faith in God and to trust God is so much will carry me so much farther than having pretty bracelets and a crown of diamonds on my head and beautiful clothes to wear. And so we're very content with what God has given us. And I hope you can find that place of contentment as you fill yourself up with Jesus and the word. So we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter five today, um, starting in verse 15. Drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad and streams of water in the streets? Let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breasts satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? 
for the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he, God, watches all of our paths. His own iniquities, I'm not sure how far we went here, his own iniquities will capture the wicked, and he will be held with the cords of his sin. He will die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. This is saying, be content with what is yours. Once you're married, be content with your wife. 20, 30 years, it only gets better and better and better. Yeah, we've hit some bumps along the way. They, they call it the seven-year itch. Sometime between, usually you're six and you're 10, you're going to hit a, a spot in there that's a little bit bumpy. Hang in there, stay in there, fight for it. Your marriage is a commitment before the Lord, commitment to each other. You get through that and it becomes so much sweeter. 40%, only 40% of those who are married up in the 30, 35 years stay together. I determined early in our marriage that I was going to be one of those 40 percenters. I was going to stay married. And we pushed through some tough stuff, probably tougher stuff than you'll ever have to push through because I've come from an abusive background and a rough um, family life, um, my birth family life. But we stayed together and it is so sweet on this side. And so they're saying, you know, in marriage, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to stay and Say to that commitment, be content with what you have. Get the exhilaration, it said, of, of the, the bride of your youth. Um, be satisfied with that sexual relationship as well as that friendship. We say your marriage is really three relationships. It's a friendship. Then it's a partnership. And then it's the, the romance and the sexual um, relationship. We need to have all three of those in balance in a marriage. And so become friends. Take that time of engagement to really get to know each other. Be friends. Do things together. Ride bikes together. Go on mission trips together. Do things together. Enjoy each other's friendship. Then when you become partners in life, you're doing the finances together. You're doing your kids together. You're doing your household work together. You're doing. You're becoming a partner with one another as well as having that romance. And if you only focus on the romance, then... You may find somebody that you don't really like and there's no friendship there or who you don't work well with together. And, and you're having to carry the major part of the load rather than being a partner throughout marriage. So you want to find somebody that you can enjoy all three of those things with. Um, and it's, so we're to enjoy what God gives us and not be covetous, covet, not to covet other things or desire things that God hasn't given us. Um, so in the um lesson you'll see that contentment is really springs from a grateful heart if you tend to covet and desire things that are not yours the best thing to start with is a, a list god thank you for my parents thank you for the opportunity to ha get an education thank you for a dishwasher i don't have to do the dishes by hand every night thank you god for books to read and to educate myself thank you for this pride this drive that you've given me to want to become a, a doctor or a, a plumber or whatever it is you want to become God, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for the sister who annoys me like crazy, but I love her to death. Thank you. you know, And write out everything you're grateful for and then go back to that and back to that. And when you find yourself coveting, wanting something that's not yours, something that God has not given you yet, go back to that heart of thankfulness. Um, what are some steps you can use to flee from temptation? My husband and I found out early in our marriage that if we didn't go walk the mall, I didn't get the, hey, I want... We need to have this for our house and I need this for my clothes and we need this and we need this and we need this. When circulars came in the mail from Walmart or Target or the hardware store, we threw them in the garbage can. We didn't sit and look through them and go, oh, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. And, you know, other people have nice things. I, I thank God for them. I think, thank you, Lord, that you provided that for them. Our kids grew up on hand-me-downs. but Oh, my goodness, God provided through hand-me-downs. They had designer clothes. They had cowboy boots when they wanted cowboy boots because God provided and in a miraculous and wonderful ways. And when they didn't get what they wanted, they recognized and were thankful for all that they had. What are you thankful for today? And then look at that key verse in verse 21. For the ways of men are behind, before the eyes of the Lord and he watches all of his paths. God is watching our path. Are we staying on that straight and narrow path? Are we thankful for what he's giving us? Are we receiving into our lives all that God has given us? And are we thankful for it instead of wanting more and more and more? I wrote a list one time um, about how to find joy and contentment in the midst. God is more interested in your heart, in your character, than he is in your circumstances. Our prayers tend to be, God, 
save me from this. Get me out of this. Make, make me more comfortable. But God never said, I'm promising you a life of comfort. No, he said, I'm promising you a life of troubles and tribulations, but that's okay because I'll be there with you and I am peace. And I will carry you through that life of troubles and tribulations and bring you to a place of heaven of great joy where you'll never have to trouble again. And so we should expect troubles and tribulations. We shouldn't expect God to pull us out of everything, but he will walk through everything with us. So in the midst, how do we find our contentment? When life is not like we want it to be, when we're stuck at home because of COVID, when we're on lockdown because of COVID, when we have to wear masks to school because of COVID, I can be bitter and angry and complain about it, or I can be grateful and thankful that I can still go and get an education or that I can have this family to be with during this time of lockdown. So let's look at 10 things to do. If you've got your pencil out, pen, pen or paper, we're going to write down 10 things to do to experience contentment and joy in the midst. Number one, we go to God. It is only he who can fill us up that God hole within us and can, can bring a complete us and make us feel satisfied. Psalm 94, 19 through 20. When my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. Psalm 94, 19 and 20. Go to God. Number two, know God. Not just about God, but get to know God in his heart. There was a, a writer, pastor um, named Ian McLaren, and this is what he said. He said, those who know the path to God can find it in the dark. In other words, I've been with God. I've prayed with God. I've talked to God. I'm trusting God. And so when those dark things come, those hard things come, I know right where to go. I can get there. I'm not bumping my knees up against all the furniture with my eyes shut. I know how to get there because I've been there and I've made a path to him. Number three, trust God. Trust in your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He will show you a way through or he will show you how to live victoriously within it. Um, Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher of bygone days, I think 18th century, um, 1800s. And he said this, when you can't see God's hand, trust his heart. God's heart is great, extravagant love for you. He wants what's best for you. He's going to do what's good for you in the eternal perspective. At the moment, it may not seem good. At the moment, I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. I don't want to be here. But when I can step back and say, but God's allowing this in my life in order to change me, to turn my heart more to him, to develop a character of God in me for eternity, then, okay, God, I'm okay. Bring it on, God. Help me through this. Teach me, grow me, and I can be content in the midst. Number four, this is a tough one. Obey God. Do what's right no matter what. John 15, 10 through 11. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've Things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that you, your joy may be made full. If you want fullness of joy, obey God. Not because it's a list of do's and don'ts and God's up there with his ruler shaking it at us and telling us you're no good if you don't do these things. No, his grace abounds. But when we're walking in obedience, we're walking as we were created to be and we're avoiding the things that are going to bring destruction and, and death into our lives, we're going to be on a walk of contentment and peace. Number five, listen for God's voice. The Bible is a great, it, it's God's word. We need to walk in it. But sometimes he gives us specific instructions as he gave Isaiah, as he gave Jeremiah, as he gave Paul. He will give specific instructions if we're listening for his voice. John 3.29, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. I'm the, the bridegroom is going to get the bride. But as his friend, I'm going to hear his voice and I'm going to have that relationship with him. The best I'm going to be the best man with Jesus Christ. I'm going to be right there with him. He's going to depend upon me to, to do what I need to do. And he's going to be 
giving to me and it's going to be a mutual relationship and I'm going to hear his voice when he speaks and my heart convicting me of sin. Um, and, and I'm going to take a break right here. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin and forgives and throws it as far as the east is from the west. Satan is the voice of condemnation and the voice that won't let it go, the voice of shame. If he is holding you legalistically to a, to a lifestyle of shame, a lifestyle of condemnation, then you're listening to the wrong person. You're listening to Satan and not God. God's Holy Spirit convicts us. We repent. We give it up. He cleanses us. We're made full. We are, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We walk forward in grace and in truth. All right, number six, worship God. If you're not feeling content, if you're if you're frustrated, if you're angry, if you're hurt, get on your knees and talk to God. Worship him. Praise him. Luke 24, 52. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy. If you want joy, worship God. Praise him. Tell him who he is. You are the great creator. You are the almighty God. I worship you. It'll put you into a the right perspective, a biblical perspective. Number seven, abide in the word, in God and in Christ. John 15, five, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him. He bears much fruit for apart from me. You can do nothing. Number eight, recognize God's power. We, he who is in us is greater than he who is in this world. Luke 10, 17, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. We have power in the name of God. Number nine, think on these things. Philippians 4, 8. Think on these things. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Set our minds on Jesus and only look at him and his things. And number 10, do what brings you joy? Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of his heart, of your heart. It doesn't mean he's going to give us everything we want. What it means is he's going to put his desires within us. And if he's given me a desire to paint, then I should be painting. If he's given me a desire to teach, I should be teaching. If he gives me a desire to fly an airplane, go fly an airplane. Take that desire, that passion that God has put within you and do what brings you joy. But let that be a part of your every day. And we'll get through this life together, encouraging one another, focusing on God and worshiping him and him alone. Find contentment. Um, it will determine the path of your life. Thank you.